Now, I've entitled the message tonight, The Word is Not Bound. The Word is Not Bound. And uh, I'd like to preach from 2 Timothy 2, verses 8 and 9. And so uh, follow with me as I read, beginning in verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Tonight we're going to preach verses 8 and 9, next week verse 10, and I want to focus on the phrase, but the word of God is not bound. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of opening up uh, your word, and thank you, Lord, for the sweetness of this service already for the children that sang and for the wonderful testimonies. And thank you for a church that in the sense of the scriptures would encourage me as their pastor. Lord, I'm so grateful. And Father, I pray that you'd help me to be a blessing tonight. And I ask that you would be glorified. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As Paul had admonished Timothy in the earlier portions of chapter 2, he had challenged him to be a faithful soldier, uh, to be a faithful farmer, uh, to be one that would be constantly after the things of God as an athlete would strive together for the gospel's sake. And so the ministry was likened to an athlete who is striving, a soldier who is fighting, or a farmer who is working hard. Paul the Apostle said, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And truly it is a work in the Lord and a labor of love. Well, as Timothy was receiving these various admonitions, Paul was using a number of terms that we obviously sense were used to challenge him in the work of the ministry. For example, he said, I charge thee, Timothy. He said, keep that which was committed unto thee, Timothy. He said, Timothy, in verse 13 of chapter 1, hold fast the form of sound words. Uh, Timothy was uh, a man that was about to assume responsibility. And there are some things you just can't quite explain. I do a lot of mentoring on a daily basis. And there are some things you just don't understand until you're right in the thick of it. I suppose it's like the difference between a flight simulator and actually being in war with Russian MiGs on your tail. I mean, the simulator is one thing, and having live fire come at you is another thing. And Paul was trying to get Timothy ready for the live fire. He was trying to prepare him for the battle that was to come. And we saw this very clearly in the early part of the chapter. But now we come to another word in, in verse number 8, and it is the word remember. And so, again, this young man being mentored under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I charge you and uh, I challenge you and keep this. Now he says, Timothy, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. What a strange thing to say to a preacher. I mean, if you were going to come up to me tonight and tell me to remember something, there's a thousand things you could tell me to remember. You could say, Pastor, uh, remember your wife's birthday. And I'd say, thank you. It's coming up next month. And you could say, Pastor, uh, don't forget to stop by our Sunday school class. Or don't forget to change your oil. Uh, you, you might say, uh, Pastor, uh, you know, don't forget to you know, carry your iPad with you. I found it laying on this bench or whatever. There's a lot of things that I need. In fact, there's really literally no way uh, that I can get through a normal day without several people reminding me of lots of stuff because uh, without some godly help, I don't think I would uh, be as smart looking as I hope I am sometimes. In fact, I've got devices that ring alarms at me and tell me when it's time to go to the next meeting and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things I need to remember but the one thing that I would not expect anybody in here to tell me to remember is the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ I mean why would someone come up to me and say pastor by the way now don't forget Jesus died and rose again I don't know if it strikes you as it strikes me that Paul is saying to Timothy amidst all this stuff fight like a soldier run like an athlete work like a farmer and don't forget Jesus died and rose again I mean, that's what you learn in first grade. 
That's not something that a preacher needs to be reminded of. So why would he say that? And I believe there's a reason, a very, very important reason I want to share with you tonight. I want you to notice the remembrance of the gospel. What Paul is telling Timothy is, in essence, Timothy, keep on remembering what you already know. In fact, why is it that some Christians just get lulled to spiritual sleep And why is it that sooner or later they're on the sidelines or out of commission? And I believe many times it's because they have failed to continually remember what excited them and changed them in the first place, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you could say, keep always in your memory, keep in constant focus, never lose sight of what Jesus Christ did for you. And so let's notice this gospel very briefly. I want you to notice, first of all, the prophecy of the gospel. The prophecy of the gospel. It says here, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised now notice that phrase the seed of David would you say that with me tonight the seed of David one more time the now Jesus Christ was a descendant of King David Jesus lineage was not a coincidence Uh, this was a promise that had been set up many hundreds of years prior now you say, but we, we're taught this morning that He's the only begotten Son, the virgin-born Son of God. He is. He is 100% God and 100% man. And on this side of the human, on this side of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, we are reminded that He was prophetically from the lineage of David. Now Genesis 49 and 10 tells us that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a law from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall be the gathering of the people be and so of the tribe of Judah then in 2nd Samuel 7 16 and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established be ever before thee thy throne shall be established forever we know obviously of Isaiah 9 and 6 uh, that of his kingdom there shall be no end And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, I'd like you to turn there for just a moment if you would please. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, we see that Jesus becomes the fulfillment of several Old Testament prophecies concerning uh, the tribe of Judah, the line of David, that Jesus Christ prophetically was the fulfillment of these prophecies concerning Jesus as Messiah. Romans 1 and verse 3 tells us concerning His Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Now in 2 Samuel 17, we are told that the throne of David would be forever. And yet David died and was buried. So how would his throne be forever? It would be such because of the seed of David came our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, uh, who resurrected from the dead. According to the prophecy, He is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is coming again as the King of kings and as the Lord of lords, and He will rule and reign over heaven for all of eternity. This is the prophecy of the gospel. And this reminds us that we are on the winning side, that we are serving a coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here the prophecy of the gospel when we find the mention of the word David it reminds us that the the virgin birth the death the bear on the resurrection all of this was prophesied in the Old Testament in fact I know it's not Christmas but let's turn to Isaiah 9 for just a minute because it's too good to pass up I just want you to see it real quickly and then we'll move right along Isaiah chapter 9 I mentioned this verse a lot at Christmas time because it is uh, so appropriate at that season but how many of you understand tonight what we're learning is the gospel gospel's appropriate every day. All the gospel. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of, what does it say please? 
and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this so the Bible says that this child that would be born this wonderful counselor this as we saw this morning mighty God is another name for Jesus Christ uh, that this mighty God the Lord Jesus Christ that he would sit upon the throne of David and that there would be no end to his kingdom so when when Paul says to Timothy remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David no doubt in Paul's mind he was going back to the school of Gamaliel he was going back to all that he had learned from the Old Testament scriptures he knew what all of the uh, all of the Pharisees knew he knew that there was a prophecy concerning the coming of this Messiah Jesus Christ now many of the other Pharisees had uh, had not received Jesus Christ as Messiah but the Apostle Paul who saw the Lord there on the road to Damascus he saw that shining light he realized this is the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament this is the one uh, of the seed of David who fulfilled the prophecy and it and he never got over the wonder of it all and oh that we would never get over the wonder of it all and this is what he was saying Timothy remember the prophecy of the gospel Remember, you serve a God who sees beginning from ending. And then he says, secondly, remember the proof of the gospel. Remember the proof of the gospel. Now notice in verse 8 it says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, notice this, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Was raised. Now, the proof of the gospel is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is because of the resurrection that we have the sealing of our hope and the prophecy is fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Had Jesus Christ who said, tear this temple down and I'll build it back again. Had Jesus Christ who said, place me into the tomb and in three days I will arise again. The, the one who prophesied his own resurrection, had he not resurrected, then we would not believe today that he is the Son of God. The proof of the gospel is found in the resurrection. And this is what we read about in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. For the Bible says, To whom he also showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Henry Morris said, The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth okay if the resurrection did not take place then Christianity is a phony religion but if it did take place then Christ is God and we have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ so we see the prophecy of the gospel Timothy don't forget the prophecy of the gospel uh, we see the proof of the gospel. That's the resurrection. Then I want you to see quickly the personalization of the gospel. The personalization of the gospel. And notice this in verse 8 again. He says, He was raised from the dead, watch this now, according to my gospel. Now, Paul is not using this word my in the sense of something that he concocted. The gospel is not of man, it's all of God. But it was his gospel because he was saved. And if you are saved, it's your gospel as well. Paul says, according to my gospel, meaning the gospel that became mine and the gospel that I shared with you, it is my gospel that was shared with you. And, and notice the personalization of the gospel. And here's what I want you to comprehend. Why would Paul say, Timothy, remember the gospel? Well, certainly he wanted him to remember all of the ramifications of fulfilled prophecy, for that uh, solidifies our faith in the Word of God. And certainly he wanted him to remember the crowning pinnacle of the resurrection, for that gives us hope that we cannot be scared even with death that we have hope even in death because of the resurrection but I believe the real reason that Timothy was told to remember the gospel is because thinking about the gospel is not just something we do for unsaved people it's something for all of us who are saved to remember daily and to preach to ourselves daily you see the 
Positive thinkers tell us, look in the mirror and tell yourself in the mirror, you can make it, tiger. Get out there and grab this world by the tail. Be strong. You can do it. Nobody else can do it like you. That's the power of positive thinking. But I want to talk to you about the power of gospel thinking. Okay, The power of gospel thinking. And here's how it goes. You, in the morning, get along with God, and you remember the gospel. And the gospel is this. I was a sinner. I am a sinner still. But God so loved me that he sent his only begotten son. And the perfect son of God lived on this earth. And he shed his blood. And that blood is the propitiation for my sin. And it doesn't matter what happened in the past or what happens in the future. Because of the shed blood, God has stated to me, he loves me and my sins are covered. And not only that, But not only am I crucified with Christ, but I am also resurrected with Christ. And because He is alive, I will be alive forevermore. And sometimes, and I believe on a daily basis, we need to pause and just remember the gospel. Remember the gospel that someone told you when you got saved. And and, and you don't get saved again, but you can get the glory of it again. And you can revel in it again. And you can remember the truth of of the blood atonement and the truth of the resurrection. And you can remember that you're not working to get saved. And it's not from a church that you get saved. And, And you can remember the gospel again and again. And you know what happens when you remember the gospel? You get a right opinion of yourself and a right opinion of Jesus Christ. And the right opinion of myself is that I'm a sinner and I'm hopeless without God. And the right opinion of Jesus Christ is that he has erased my sin and that he has placed me as one who is accepted in the beloved and that he is wonderful and that he's given me a position with him. And I believe that's why Paul said, Timothy, remember the gospel. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember where you used to be. Remember where you're headed. I believe every one of us could go up to someone tonight and say, don't forget the gospel. You have a friend that's discouraged. You have someone that's depressed. You might remind them this week about the gospel. Remind them about what God has done for them. He says, Timothy, remember the gospel. We see the remembrance of the gospel. But I want you to just think secondly with me tonight about the resilience of God's servant. The resilience of God's servant. Now notice in verse 9, He mentions the gospel in verse 8. Then Paul says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even into bonds. Now what an amazing turn. These verses, they turn corners on us. One moment we're at the glory of the gospel, the resurrection. The next moment he says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. He says it's because of that gospel. By the way, why would Paul speak that? Why would he say wherein I suffer? Where was he when he wrote this letter? in prison he was in a Roman prison I told you a few weeks ago this prison was 14 feet below ground it had two compartments this prison was not a long-term prison you were not expected to live long you would die from this prison And Paul, as he's writing, oh, Timothy, remember, Timothy, remember the gospel. It's it's the remembrance of the prophecy, the remembrances of the power of the gospel. That's what's going to help you. And he said, wherein? He said, in fact, it's because of the gospel that I'm suffering right now, because of the gospel that I'm in prison. I think about the faithfulness of the apostle. He was willing to suffer trouble for the gospel. You know, I've noticed as a pastor... Sometimes, simply for holding on to the truths of the gospel, for believing what you've believed for 31 years and not wavering, and not bending with the culture or bending with some that want to try to change certain things, sometimes you'll suffer trouble just for being consistent. Paul, no doubt, was consistent. 
He was not going to waver on that gospel message. He didn't care if it was King Agrippa. He was going to preach the whole counsel of God. And he said, sometimes you suffer trouble as a faithful servant. And I don't know if you've ever suffered trouble or felt discrimination just for being a, a child of God or had somebody gossip against you because you were too zealous for the Lord or because you were trying to live a sanctified life for the Lord. I don't know if you've ever felt that. But if you have, I want to say, you're in good company tonight. In fact, last time I checked, our Savior suffered on the cross because He never wavered in His claim concerning His identity as the Son of God. The faithfulness of the Apostle. That's why Paul said to Timothy in chapter 2 and verse 3, Endure hardness, Timothy. That's why in 2 Timothy 4 and 5, watch thou in all things, he said, and, and in chapter 4 and verse 5, he said, Endure afflictions, Timothy. You're going to have afflictions. You're going to have difficulty. You say, Pastor, you've spoken of that a lot during this series. You know why? Because it's come up about every couple of verses that uh, if you're going to remember the gospel and preach the gospel and live the gospel, not everybody's going to be happy about that. But he says, just, just be faithful, Timothy. The faithfulness of the gospel, very clearly seen here. But then I think of the foes of the gospel. Notice what it says. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Notice this next phrase. Even unto bonds. I mean, Paul said, I am treated as an evildoer. That, that's the word malefactor. He said, I'm being treated like a common criminal because I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know there are places that this is still happening? There are countries where people are imprisoned for passing out tracts. Remember years ago, I think I was in my early 20s and I had been preaching in, in Singapore uh, at the Bible Baptist Church and they said one day we're going to go to Malaysia and we're going to go over there and, and we're going to meet with some believers in a restaurant and we want you to do a Bible study. Boy, I had a pocket full of tracks. I'd never been to Malaysia. I'm like, all right, that's great. Let's go over to Malaysia. And um, my name's Paul. I'm not the apostle, but let's do our best anyways today. And I was excited. I, I took out a gospel track. We were just coming through customs. I saw a guy standing over there. I went over and I gave him a, gave him a track. And the missionary came and said, oh, Brother Chapel, I forgot to tell you. Do not pass out tracks here. Proselytizing has a crime. It's a crime and it has a penalty. And the penalty for proselytizing is they cut your hand off. And I, remember, I remember telling him, thanks for telling me that before we came into the country. It's funny to me, in these Muslim countries and in these communist countries, they say, oh, we believe in freedom of religion. You can believe whatever you want, just don't tell anybody else. How many of you are thankful we still have some of our freedom of speech left in America? And, and he, said, he said, sometimes in this ministry that I've experienced, I've been treated, he says, as an evildoer in verse uh, number nine. I suffer as an evildoer, even unto bonds. He was not being treated as a minor crook. He was being chained in an underground prison as a major criminal. He was facing the death penalty for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus was treated as an evildoer, and his soldiers may be treated the same. That's what Paul was telling Timothy. Timothy, I want you to Learn to be resilient like I've been resilient. When you're treated poorly for Christ, then, then keep on going. When the foes come against you, then keep on going. And, and so we see the remembrance of the gospel. Don't stop living the gospel, thinking of the gospel, dreaming of the gospel. Remember the gospel because that's going to give you resilience in the difficult times. And you'll keep your mind on the fact that you can't be scared. Even with death, you can't be scared because you will rise again in that last day. And then finally, I want you to see our thought for the night. Notice the remembrance of the gospel, the resilience of his servant, and then the reach of the Bible. The reach of the Bible. How many of you believe in the power of the Word of God? <laughs> for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank God for that. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh, thank God for that. Thank God that it cuts between the, the joints and thank God that it weaves its way through the marrow and thank God that it punctures and touches the very heart of man, spiritually speaking. 
It's a sharp, two-edged sword. The reach of the Bible. I think of the reach of the Bible. How powerful is God's Word? So powerful that a prisoner in Rome 2,000 years ago could pin these very words and that we tonight and that hundreds of millions of other Christians have heard them and been touched by them all the way from a prison cell to this church tonight. That is a testimony to the power of the Word of God. But I draw your attention to this in verse 9 as we close. Notice, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but, but, how many of you are glad we're turning corners again? We were suffering as an evildoer, we're in jail, but the word of God is not bound. Let's say that last phrase together, shall we? But the word of God, one more time, but the word of God is not bound. Now here we see the reach of the Bible, and here we're encouraged tonight. And here we think of missionaries coming next week from Cambodia and Egypt and places where at one time it may have been difficult to be a soul winner. I think of Cambodia, the killing fields. I think of the great uh, massacres that took place there and the piling up of the hundreds of thousands of skulls and communism's stronghold on Cambodia. And I tell you, there are dozens and dozens of missionaries now building churches in Cambodia. Why? Because the Word of God is not bound, you see. God's Word is there and working. Now, let's think of this for a moment. First of all, I want you to think of the definition of the Word of God. I, I, I love this phrase, the Word of God. My friends, I have stood in this pulpit for 31 years, and I have said, open the Bible. I have said the Bible is the Word of God. I'm thankful for that. My Word is not the Word of God. The church's Word is not the Word of God. But in my hands tonight, these 66 books, written by some 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years, were fully inspired of the Holy Spirit of God. They were collected and canonized and preserved so that tonight we can stand here and say, this is the Word of God. Take out your Bible, the Word of God, so that tomorrow with your five-year-old and your fifth grader, you can say, let's turn to the Word of God. Let's see what God's Word says on this matter. God's Word matters more uh, than USA Today or New York Times and especially the Los Angeles Times. I'm telling you, God's Word matters more than CNN and even Fox News and and all the rest of it that you might read this week. God's Word stands like a rock undaunted. It is reliable. It is trustworthy. It is beautiful. And you can follow the Word of God. The Word of God. This phrase, the Word of God. This phrase speaks of authorship. The author of this book is God. All Scripture is given by inspiration. That word inspiration, theopneustos, means God breathed. It means that the Holy Spirit breathed His words into the human authors and that they in turn pinned out what God had already breathed into them. It wasn't their ideas. It wasn't their thoughts. Oh, we know. And the National Geographic Channel and other uh, such a ridiculous outpost tell us about uh, the, the Gnostic Gospels and this Gospel and that Gospel and Joseph Smith's Gospel. Hey, yes, there's a lot of Gospels out there. But I'm telling you, my friend, God's Word is contained in this book right here. Well, they can, in their silly way, try to talk about this gospel and that article and what about, uh, what about the Apocrypha and what about this and that. There are, there are many tests that go in to the doctrine of bibliology and to the idea and the doctrine of the canonization of the Scripture. We do not have time tonight, but suffice to say that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so this phrase, the Word of God, speaks of authorship and it speaks secondly of authority authority now the church did not have the entire bible to this point paul of course had not yet written this his final letter it had not been placed into the canonization and one of the tests concerning that matter would be his apostleship and the fact that he had seen the resurrected christ and this book was not a part of the canon as of yet but Paul knew concerning the Old Testament scriptures and other epistles that God had given to him for the church. And, and there would be a few more uh, books coming, like the book of the Revelation from, from the Apostle John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. However, what had been inspired was now recognized as the Word of God. It did not have to wait 
for some church council uh, to agree. It was already being circulated and accepted amongst the believers in the churches uh, throughout Asia Minor, uh, uh, throughout the Mediterranean region. Uh, they received it as the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 says they received it as it was in truth the Word of God. You see, it wasn't left to the higher criticism. It wasn't left to the church councils uh, to determine what was the Word of God. The churches already knew what the Word of God was. In fact, Luke chapter 24 and verse 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures of these things concerning himself. In other words, Jesus Christ, as he uh, expounded to many audiences, was quoting from the very Word of God. He was quoting and expounding from the Old Testament Scriptures, which had been preserved and canonized, and, and uh, the, the tablets of the law had been kept in the Ark of the Covenant, and that process all the way down until the days of John the Baptist. The Bible had been preserved, and then the New Testament uh, Scriptures added. And so when you hear the phrase, the Word of God, you're hearing a phrase that is uh, speaking of authorship and it's speaking of authority and it's speaking of God superintending uh, throughout all of the years. And while we do not believe in the concept of a double inspiration, we believe inspiration happened one time as the Word of God was given and written, but we do believe that God has superintended in the process of keeping His Word. And we thank the Lord for the amazing, uh, amazing work considering uh, the great uh, the great efforts to bring about the King James Version of the Bible and the authorship is of God, but we think of the scholars involved and we think of the texts that were involved and we just pause tonight and say, when we read the phrase, Word of God, we're thankful that we have it tonight. The definition of the Word of God is wonderful. The phrase is so wonderful. But then I want you to notice here, the Word of God, and then it says this, is not bound. And so I want to speak to you about the delivery here. The delivery of the Word of God. The reach of the Bible. It is in definition God's Word. It is in delivery, not bound or hindered. It will reach its destination. And I think about this. There are many that I believe have intentionally tried to corrupt the Bible. There are many there are Bibles on the shelf today that have literally taken out verses, numerous verses, just completely taken them out. There are Bibles that have, as I've told you often, called Mary a young woman rather than a virgin. There are many that have taken out the word blood and inserted the word death and insulted and demeaned the doctrine of the blood atonement. There, there are many that have attempted to corrupt the Word. But may I say you, to you tonight that the Bible, according to 1 Peter, is the incorruptible Word of God. And while there may be some corrupted seed that abounds, and while there may be some weakened translation that abound, I'm thankful tonight for the incorruptible Word of God. I'm thankful for the pure seed that we can plant into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. And I'm thankful that despite the corruption that exists, that God's Word truly, the true Word of God, is incorruptible tonight. Nothing I can say, nothing you can say will ever diminish the potency of the Word of God. It's incorruptible. I say to you tonight that no deception can diminish the power of the Word of God. For God's Word is not bound by false translations, by false teachers, by the deception of cults. God's Word cannot be bound. God will always make sure that His Word goes forth and that His Word is delivered. And, and I say this to you tonight because sometimes you may share a verse with someone in the form of a card, in the form of a gospel tract, in, in some study or some way with your children, and you may feel that it never did any good. And I am telling you, it cannot be bound. It cannot be limited. It cannot be diverted. That God will somehow, some way, use His Word. It may not be today. It may be tomorrow. But the delivery will go forth. And God will do something with His Word. In fact, would you turn to Isaiah 55 and verse 11 tonight? Isaiah 55 and verse 11. What a wonderful verse, Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be 
that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now let's say that phrase, it shall not return unto me void. Ready, begin. It shall not return unto me void. The word void means empty. The word void means without purpose or harvest. And God says, my word, if you'll just get it out, it will not return unto me void. That's why we believe in gospel tract distribution. Because there are many people that will take a gospel tract, and this has happened a hundred times that I know of in our ministry here. They'll put it in their drawer at home. They'll never read it until someone dies, until someone has a tragedy, and they're cleaning out the drawer, and they see that tract. And then in God's moment, He takes that seed that you planted, and that word returns unto Him with harvest. And God uses His word. And it might be a sermon I preached, and thought that no one listened, just like a young man that I met this morning in his 20s who said to me, Pastor Chapel, he said, I just want you to know I got saved in this church when I was seven years old on the bus ministry. Some Sunday school teacher probably thought, I don't think I did a very good job today. One of our teachers said that to me today. He said, I had so many kids in my class, I did my best, Pastor. It was a wild, crazy day, and probably the devil tried to discourage him. And here's a, here's a young man in his 20s who said to me, I was seven years old, and someone threw the seed out, and God's word did not return unto him void. Look, it, it's not for me to be faithful to God depending upon the numbers of people that respond in a given day. It's for me to realize I've just got to keep getting the seed out. When he wants that seed to germinate and how high he wants it to go, that's his business. If I take care of, of, the, of the depth of the ministry, he'll take care of the breadth of the ministry. I just want to keep throwing seed in the row, throwing seed in the row, and let God bring it up in his time and in his way. He said, I, it will not return unto me void or empty. God is going to bless the messenger and and he's going to bless the message if we will but be faithful. Acts chapter 18 and verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. I just want to encourage every teacher and every parent and every one of you tonight. That when you share God's word and when you witness with the gospel. And you share the gospel with someone. It might seem that a child doesn't want it anymore. It might seem that no one ever listened. But God has promised must have seen his word that that word will not return unto him void that there will be a product from a faithful soul winning Christian getting the word of God out and so tonight Paul is challenging Timothy Timothy I want you to remember the gospel don't let the gospel be that thing that you remembered and heard on April the 5th, 1972. All right, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe it. I'm saved. Now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? I'll tell you what. Take the gospel with you every day. I want you to turn to the person next to you right now and tell them the day you got saved. What was the day? Tell them right now. All right? Okay, that's enough. You only got saved one time. I mean, <laughs> how many of you remember that day? Amen. That's the day. I'm a sinner. Jesus came, He shed His blood, He rose again. He's living in me. Live it, believe it, think about it every day. Hey, Brother Bud, don't forget Sharon's birthday. Yeah, you need to remember that. <laughs> don't forget to lock the door. Don't forget. Don't forget the gospel. Timothy, don't forget what Jesus did for you. It's going to help you. And he said, by the way, it's also the reason I'm suffering. So, Timothy, while you're remembering the gospel, remain faithful to Jesus. And Timothy, while you're remaining faithful, don't forget, spread the word. Spread the word because it will not return unto God void. The word of God is not bound, Timothy. And, and if you'll just preach the sermon, God will get it out where he wants it to go. 
So remember to spread my word everywhere you go.